The Man Who Hated Mars by Gordon Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Castle. To escape from Mars, all Clayton had to do was the impossible. Break out of a crack-proof exile camp, get onto a ship that couldn't be boarded, smash through an impenetrable wall of steel. Perhaps he could do all these things, but he discovered that Mars did evil things to men, that he wasn't even Clayton anymore. He was only the man who hated Mars. I want you to put me in prison, the big hairy man said in a trembling voice. He was addressing his request to a thin woman sitting behind a desk that seemed much too big for her. The plaque on the desk said, Lieutenant Phoebe Harris, Terrain Rehabilitation Service. Lieutenant Harris glanced at the man before her for only a moment before she returned her eyes to the dossier on the desk, but long enough to verify the impression his voice had given. Ron Clayton was a big, ugly, cowardly, dangerous man. He said, Well, damn it, say something! The lieutenant raised her eyes again. Just be patient until I've read this. Her voice and eyes were expressionless, but her hand moved beneath the desk. Clayton froze. She's yellow, he thought. She's turned on the trackers. He could see the pale greenish glow of their little eyes watching him all around the room. If he made any fast move, they would cut him down with a stun beam before he could get two feet. She thought he was going to jump her. Little rat. He thought somebody ought to slap her down. He watched her check through the heavy dossier in front of her. Finally, she looked up at him again. Clayton, your last conviction was for strong-armed robbery. You were given a choice between prison on Earth and freedom here on Mars. You picked Mars. He nodded slowly. He'd been broke and hungry at the time. A sneaky little rat named Johnson had built Clayton out of his fair share of the Corey payroll job, and Clayton had been forced to get the money somehow. He hadn't mussed the guy up too much. Besides, it was the sucker's own fault if he hadn't tried to yell. Lieutenant Harris went on. I'm afraid you can't back down now. But it isn't fair. The most that I've got on that frame-up would have been ten years. I've been here fifteen already. I'm sorry, Clayton. It can't be done. You're here. Period. Forget about trying to get back. Earth doesn't want you. Her voice sounded choppy, as though she was trying to keep it calm. Clayton broke into a whining rage. You can't do that. It isn't fair. I never did anything to you. I'll go and talk to the governor. He'll listen to reason. Y you'll see. Shut, Shut up. The woman snapped harshly. I'm getting sick of it. I personally think you should have been locked up permanently. I think this whole idea of forced colonisation is going to breed trouble for Earth some day. But it's about the only way you can get anybody to colonise this frozen hunk of mud. Just keep it in mind that I don't like it any better than you do. I didn't strong-arm anybody to deserve this assignment. Now get out of here! She moved her hand threateningly towards the manual controls of the stun beam. Clayton retreated fast. The trackers ignored anyone walking away from the desk. They were set only to spot threatening movements towards it. Outside the rehabilitation service building, Clayton could feel the tears running down the inside of his face mask. He'd asked again and again. God only knew how many times in the past fifteen years. Always the same answer. No. When he'd heard that this new administrator was a woman, he'd hoped she might be easier to convince. She wasn't. If anything, she was harder than the others. The heat-sucking frigidity of the thin Martian air whispered around him in the feeble breeze. He shivered a little and began walking toward the recreation centre. There was a high, thin piping in the sky above him, which quickly became a scream in the thin air. He turned for a moment to watch the ship land, squinting his eyes to see the number on the hull. 52. Space Transport Ship 52 probably bring in another load of poor suckers to freeze to death on Mars. That was the thing he hated about Mars. The cold. The everlasting damned cold. And the oxidation pills. Take one every three hours or smother in the poor thin air. The government could have put up domes. It could have put in building to building tunnels at least. It could have done a hell of a lot of things to make Mars a decent place for human beings. But no, the government had other ideas. A bunch of big-shot scientific characters had come up with the idea nearly 23 years before. Clayton could remember the words on the sheet he'd been given when he was sentenced. 
Mankind is inherently an adaptable animal. If we are to colonize the planets of the solar system, we must meet the conditions on those planets as best we can. Financially, it is impracticable to change an entire planet from its original condition to one which will support human life as it exists on Terra. But man, since he is adaptable, can change himself, modify his structure slightly, so that he can live on these planets with only a minimum of change in the environment. So they made you live outside and like it. So you froze, and you choked, and you suffered. Clayton hated Mars. He hated the thin air and the cold. More than anything, he hated the cold. Ron Clayton wanted to go home. The recreation building was just ahead. At least it would be warm inside. He pushed in through the outer and inner doors, and he heard the burst of music from the jukebox, his stomach tightening up into a hard cramp. They were playing Heinlein's Green Hills of Earth. There was almost no other sound in the room, although it's full of people. There were plenty of colonists who claimed to like Mars, but even they were silent when that song was played. Clayton wanted to go over and smash the machine, make it stop reminding him. He clenched his teeth and his fists and his eyes and cursed mentally. God, how I hate Mars. When the hauntingly nostalgic last chorus faded away, he walked over to the machine and fed it full of enough coins to keep it going on something else until he left. At the bar, he ordered a beer and used it to wash down another oxidation tablet. It wasn't good beer. It didn't even deserve the name. The atmospheric pressure was so low as to boil all the carbon dioxide out of it. The brewers never put it back in after fermentation. He was sorry for what he'd done, really and truly sorry. If they'd only give him one more chance, he'd make good. Just one more chance, he'd work things out. He'd promised himself that both times they'd put him up before, but things had been different then. He hadn't really been given another chance pot with parole boards and all. Clayton closed his eyes and finished the beer. He ordered another. He'd worked in the mines for fifteen years. It wasn't that he'd minded work really, but the foreman had it in for him, always giving him a bad time, always picking out the lousy jobs for him. Like the time he'd crawled into a side boring in Tunnel 12 for, for a nap during lunch. The foreman had caught him. When he promised never to do it again if the foreman wouldn't put it on a report, the guy said, Yeah, sure. I hate to hurt a good guy's record. Then he'd put Clayton on report anyway. Strictly a rat. Not that Clayton ran any chance of being fired. They never fired anybody. But they'd fined him a day's pay. A whole day's pay. He tapped his glass on the bar. And the barman came over with another beer. Clayton looked at it, then up at the barman. Put a head on it. The bartender looked at him sourly. I've got some soap suds here, Clayton. One of these days I'm going to put him in your beer if you keep pulling that gag. That was the trouble with some guys. No sense of humour. Somebody came in the door, and then somebody else came in behind him. So both inner and outer doors were open for an instant. A blast of icy breeze struck Clayton's back and he shivered. He started to say something, then changed his mind. The doors were already closed again, and besides, one of the guys was bigger than he was. The iciness didn't seem to go away immediately. It was like the mine. Little old Mars was cold, clear down to her core. Or at least as far down as they'd drilled. The walls were frozen, seemed to radiate a chill that pulled the heat right out of your blood. Somebody was playing Green Hills again, damn them. Evidently, all of his own selections had run out earlier than he thought they would. Hell, there was nothing to do here. He might as well go home. Give me another beer, Mac. He'd go home as soon as he finished this one. He stood there with his eyes closed, listening to the music and hating Mars. A voice next to him said, I'll have a whiskey. The voice sounded as if the man had a bad cold, and Clayton turned slowly to look at him. After all the sterilisation they went through before they left Earth, nobody on Mars ever had a cold. So there was only one thing that would make a man's voice sound like that. Clayton was right. The fellow had an oxygen tube clamped firmly over his nose. He was wearing the uniform of the Space Transport Service. Just get in on the ship, 
Clayton asked conversationally. The man nodded and grinned. Yeah, four hours before we take off again. He poured down the whiskey. Sure cold out. Clayton agreed. It's always cold. He watched enviously as the spaceman ordered another whiskey. Clayton couldn't afford whiskey. He probably could have by this time, if the mines had made him a foreman like they should have. Maybe he could talk the spaceman out of a couple of drinks. My name's Clayton. Ron Clayton. The spaceman took the offered hand. Mine's Parkinson, but everybody calls me Parks. Sure, Parks. Um, can I buy you a beer? Parks shook his head. No, thanks. I started on whiskey. Here, let me buy you one. Well, thanks. Don't mind if I do. They drank them in silence, and Parks ordered two more. Been here long? Parks asked. Fifteen years. Fifteen long, long years. Did you, uh, I, I mean... Parks looked suddenly confused. Clayton glanced quickly to make sure the bartender was out of earshot. Then he grinned. You mean, am I a convict? No, I came here because I wanted to. But, he lowered his voice, we don't talk about it around here, you know? He gestured with one hand, a gesture that took in everyone else in the room. Parks glanced around quickly, moving only his eyes. Yeah, I see, he said softly. This your first trip? asked Clayton. First time to Mars. Been on the lunar run a long time. Low pressure bother you much? Not much. We only keep it as six pounds in the ships. Half helium, half oxygen. Only thing that bothers me is the oxy here. Or rather, the oxy that isn't here took a deep breath through his nose tube to emphasise his point. Clayton clamped his teeth together, making the muscles at the side of his jaw stand out. Parks didn't notice. You guys have to take those pills, don't you? Yeah. I had to take them once. Got stranded on Luna. The cat I was in broke down eighty-some miles from Aristarchus base, and I had to walk back with my oxy low. Well, I figured... Clayton listened to Park's story with a great show of attention, but he had heard it before. This Lost on Moon stuff and its variations had been going the rounds for fifty years. Every once in a while it actually did happen to someone, just often enough to keep the story going. This guy did have a couple of new twists, but not enough to make the story worthwhile. Boy, Clayton said when Parks had finished, you were lucky to come out of that alive. Parks nodded, well pleased with himself, and bought another round of drinks. Something like that happened to me a couple of years ago, Clayton began. I'm a supervisor on the third shift in the mines at Zanti, but at the time I was only a foreman. One day, a couple of guys went to the branch tunnel to... It was a very good story. Clayton had made it up himself, so he knew that Parks had never heard it before. It was gory in just the right places with a nice effect at the end. So I had to hold up the rocks with my back while the rescue crew pulled the others out of the tunnel by crawling between my legs. Finally they got some steel beams down there to take the load off and I could let go. I was in hospital for a week, he finished. Parks was nodding vaguely. Clayton looked up at the clock above the bar and realised that they'd been talking for better than an hour. Parks was buying another round. Parks was a hell of a nice fellow. There was, Clayton found, only one trouble with Parks. He got to talking so loud that the bartender refused to serve either one of them any more. The bartender said Clayton was getting loud too, but it was just because he had to talk loud to make Parks hear him. Clayton helped Parks put his mask and parker on, and they walked out into the cold night. Parks began to sing Green Hills. About halfway through, he stopped and turned to Clayton. I'm from Indiana. Clayton had already spotted him as an American by his accent. Indiana? That's nice. Real nice. Yeah, you talk about green hills. We got green hills in Indiana. What time is it? Clayton told him. Jeez, whole spaceship takes off in an hour. Ought to have one more drink first. Clayton realized he didn't like Parks, but maybe he'd buy a bottle. Sharky Johnson worked in fuel section and he made a nice little sideline of stealing alcohol, cutting it, selling it. 
He thought it was really funny to call it Martian gin. Clayton said, Let's go over to Sharky's. Sharky will sell us a bottle. Okay, said Parks. We'll get a bottle. That's what we need, a bottle. It was quite a walk to Shark's place. It was so cold that even Parks was beginning to sober up a little. He was laughing like hell when Clayton started to sing. We're going over to the Sharks to buy a jug of gin for Parks. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. One thing about a few drinks, you didn't get so cold. You didn't feel it too much, anyway. The shark still had his light on when they arrived. Clayton whispered to Parks. I'll go in. He knows me. He wouldn't sell it if you were around. You got eight credits. Sure, I got eight credits. Just a minute. And I'll give you eight credits. He fished around for a minute inside his parker and pulled out his note case. His gloved fingers were a little clumsy, but he managed to get out a five and three ones and hand them to Clayton. You wait here, Clayton said. He went in through the outer door and knocked on the inner one. He should have asked for ten credits. Sharky only charged five, and that would leave him three for himself. But he could have got ten, maybe more. When he came out with the bottle, Parks was sitting on a rock, shivering. Jeez, he said. It's cold out here. Let's get to some place where it's warm. Sure, I got the bottle. Want a drink? Parks took the bottle, opened it and took a good belt out of it. Whew, he breathed. Pretty smooth. As Clayton drank, Park said, Hey, I better get back to the field. I know, we can go to the men's room and finish the bottle before the ship takes off. Isn't that a good idea? It's warm in there. They started back down the street toward the space field. Yeah, I'm from Indiana. Southern part, down near Bloomington, Park said. Give me the jug. Not Bloomington, Illinois. Bloomington, Indiana. We really got green hills down there. He drank and handed the bottle back to Clayton. Personally, I don't see why anybody stays on Mars. Here you're practically on the equator in the middle of the summer and it's colder than hell. Now if you were smart, you'd go home where it's warm. Mars wasn't built for people to live on anyhow. I don't see how you stand it. That was when Clayton decided he really hated Parks. And when Parks said, Why be dumb, friend? Why don't you go home? Clayton kicked him in the stomach hard. And that, and that, Clayton said as Parks doubled over. He said it again as he kicked him in the head and in the ribs. Parks was gasping as he writhed on the ground but he soon lay still. Then Clayton saw why. Parks' nose tube had come off when Clayton's foot struck his head. Parks was breathing heavily, but he wasn't getting any oxygen. That was when the big idea hit wrong Clayton. With a nose piece on like that, you couldn't tell who a man was. He took another drink from the jug, and then he began to take Parks' clothes off. The uniform fit Clayton fine, and so did the nose mask. He dumped his own clothing on top of Park's nearly nude body, adjusted the little oxygen tank so that the gas would flow properly through the mask, took the first deep breath of good air he'd had in fifteen years, and walked towards the space field. He went into the men's room at the port building, took a drink, and felt in the pocket of the uniform for Park's identification. He found it, and opened the booklet. It read, Parkinson, Herbert J. Steward, second class, STS. Above it was a photo and a set of fingerprints. Clayton grinned. They'd never know it wasn't Parks getting on the ship. Parks was a steward too, a cook's helper. That was good. If he'd been a jetman or something like that, the crew might wonder why he wasn't on duty at takeoff. But a steward was different. Clayton sat for several minutes looking through the booklet and drinking from the bottle. He emptied it just before the warning sirens keened through the thin air. Clayton got up and went outside toward the ship. Wake up! Hey, you! Wake up! Somebody was slapping his cheeks. Clayton opened his eyes and looked at the blurred face over his own. From a distance, another voice said, Who is it? The blurred face said, I don't know. He was asleep behind these cases. I think he's drunk. Clayton wasn't drunk. He was sick. His head felt like hell. Where the devil was he? Get up, bud. Come on, get up. Clayton pulled himself up by holding to the man's arm. 
The effort made him dizzy and nauseated. The other man said, Take him down to sick bay, Casey. Get some theamine into him. Clayton didn't struggle as they led him down to the sick bay. He was trying to clear his head. Where was he? He must have been pretty drunk last night. He remembered meeting Parks and getting thrown out by the bartender. Then what? Oh yeah, he'd gone to the Sharks for a bottle. From there on it was mostly gone. He remembered a fight or something, but that was all that registered. The medic in the sick bay fired two shots from a hypo gun into his arms. But Clayton ignored a slight sting. Where am I? Real original. Here, take these. He handed Clayton a couple of capsules and gave him a glass of water to wash them down with. When the water hit his stomach, there was an immediate reaction. Oh, Christ, the medic said. Get a mop, somebody. Here, buddy, heave into this. It took them the better part of an hour to get Clayton awake enough to realise what was going on and where he was. Even then, he was plenty groggy. It was the first officer of the SDS-52 who finally got the story straight. As soon as Clayton was in condition, the medic and the quartermaster officer who had found him took him up to the first officer's compartment. I was checking through the stores this morning when I found this man. He was asleep, dead drunk, behind the crates. He was drunk all right supplied the medic. I found this in his pocket. He flipped a booklet to the first officer. The first was a young man, not older than twenty-eight, with tough-looking grey eyes. He looked over the booklet. Where did you get Parkinson's ID booklet? And his uniform? Clayton looked down at his clothes in wonder. I don't know. You don't know? That's a hell of an answer. Well, I was drunk. Clayton said defensively. A man doesn't know what he's doing when he's drunk. He frowned in concentration. He knew he'd have to think up some story. I kind of remember we we made a bet. I bet him I could, could get on the ship. Sure, I, yeah, I, I remember now. That's what happened. I bet him I could get on the ship and we traded clothes. Where is he now? Well, at my place, sleeping it off, I guess. Without his oxy mask? Oh, I, I, I gave him oxidation pills for the mask. The first shook his head. It sounds like the kind of trick Parkinson would pull, all right. I'll have to write it up and turn you both in to the authorities when we hit Earth. He eyed Clayton. What's your name? Cartwright, Sam Cartwright, Clayton said without batting an eye. Volunteer or convicted colonist? Volunteer. The first looked at him for a long moment disbelief in his eyes. It didn't matter. Volunteer or convict, there was no place Clayton could go. From the officer's viewpoint, he was as safely imprisoned in the spaceship as he would be on Mars or a prison on Earth. The first wrote in the logbook, and then said, Well, we're one man short in the kitchen. You wanted to take Parkinson's place? Brother, you got it. Without pay. He paused for a moment. You know, of course, he said judiciously, that you'll be shipped back to Mars immediately, and you'll have to work out your passage both ways. It will be deducted from your pay. Clayton nodded. I know. I don't know what else will happen. If there's a conviction, you may lose your volunteer status on Mars, and there may be fines taken out of your pay, too. Well, that's all, Cartwright. You can report to Kissman in the kitchen. The first pressed a button on his desk and spoke into the intercom. Who was on duty at the airlock when the crew came aboard last night? Send him up. I want to talk to him. Then the quartermaster officer led Clayton out of the door and took him to the kitchen. The ship's driver tubes were pushing it along at a steady 500 centimetres per second squared, pushing her steadily closer to Earth with a little more than half a gravity of drive. There wasn't much for Clayton to do, really. He helped to select the foods that went into the automatics, and he cleared them out after each meal was cooked. Once every day he had to partially dismantle them for a really thorough going over. And all the time he was thinking. Parkinson must be dead, he knew that. That meant the chamber. And even if he wasn't, they'd send Clayton back to Mars. Luckily, there was no way for either planet to communicate with the ship. It was hard enough to keep a beam trained on a planet without trying to hit such a comparatively small thing as a ship. But they would know about it on Earth by now. They would pick him up the instant the ship landed. 
and the best he could hope for was a return to Mars. No, by God, he wouldn't go back to that frozen mud ball. He'd stay on Earth where it was warm and comfortable and a man could live where he was meant to live, where there was plenty of air to breathe and plenty of water to drink, where the beer tasted like beer and not like slop. Earth, good green hills, the like of which exist nowhere else. Slowly, over the days, he evolved a plan. He watched and waited, and checked each little detail to make sure nothing could go wrong. It couldn't go wrong. He didn't want to die, and he didn't want to go back to Mars. Nobody on the ship liked him. They couldn't appreciate his position. He hadn't done anything to them, but they just didn't like him. He didn't know why. He tried to get along with them. Well, if they didn't like him, the hell with them. If things worked out the way he figured, they'd be damn sorry. He was very clever about the whole plan. When turnover came, he pretended to get violently space sick. That gave him an opportunity to steal a bottle of chloral hydrate from the medic's locker. And while he worked in the kitchen, he spent a great deal of time sharpening a big carving knife. Once, during his off time, he managed to disable one of the ship's two lifeboats. He was saving the other for himself. The ship was eight hours away from Earth, and still decelerating when Clayton pulled his getaway. It was surprisingly easy. He was supposed to be asleep when he sneaked down to the drive compartment with the knife. He pushed open the door, looked in, and grinned like an ape. The engineer and the two jetmen were out cold from the chloral hydrate in the coffee from the kitchen. Moving rapidly, he went to the spares locker and began methodically to smash every replacement part for the drivers. Then he took three of the signal bombs from the emergency kit, set them for five minutes, and placed them around the driver circuits. He looked at the three sleeping men. What if they woke up before the bombs went off? He didn't want to kill them, though. He wanted them to know what had happened and who had done it. He grinned. There was a way. He simply had to drag them outside and jam the door lock. He took the key from the engineer, inserted it, turned it, and snapped off the head, leaving the body of the key still in the lock. Nobody would unjam it in the next four minutes. Then he began to run up the stairwell toward the good lifeboat. He was panting and out of breath when he arrived, but no one had stopped him, no one had even seen him. He clambered into the lifeboat, made everything ready, and waited. The signal bombs were not heavy charges. Their main purpose was to make a flare bright enough to be seen for thousands of miles in space. Fluorine and magnesium made plenty of light and heat. Quite suddenly there was no gravity. He had felt nothing, but he knew that the bombs had exploded. He punched the launch switch on the control board of the lifeboat and the little ship leaped out from the side of the greater one. Then he turned on the drive, set it at half a G and watched the SDS-52 drop behind him. It was no longer decelerating, so it would miss Earth and drift on into space. On the other hand, the life ship would come down very neatly within a few hundred miles of the spaceport in Utah, the destination of the SDS-52. Landing the life ship would be the only difficult part of the manoeuvre, but they were designed to be handled by beginners. Full instructions were printed on the simplified control board. Clayton stood at them for a while, then set the alarm to wake him in seven hours and dozed off to sleep. He dreamed of Indiana. It was full of nice green hills and leafy woods, and Parkinson was inviting him over to his mother's house for chicken and whiskey, and all for free. Beneath the dream was the calm assurance that they would never catch him and send him back. When the STS-52 failed to show up, they would think he had been lost with it. They would never look for him. When the alarm rang, Earth was a mottled globe looming hugely beneath the ship. Clayton watched the dials on the board and began to follow the instructions on the landing sheet. He wasn't too good at it. The accelerometer climbed higher and higher and he felt as though he could hardly move his hands to the proper switches. He was less than 15 feet off the ground when his hand slipped. The ship, out of control, shifted, spun, and toppled over on its side, smashing a great hole in the cabin. Clayton shook his head and tried to stand up in the wreckage. He got to his hands and knees, dizzy but unhurt, and took a deep breath of the fresh air that was blowing in through the hole in the cabin. It felt just like home. Bureau of Criminal Investigation, 
Regional Headquarters, Cheyenne, Wyoming, 20th of January, 2102. 2. Space Transport Service, Subject, Live Ship 2, STS-52. Attention, Mr. P. D. Latimer. Dear Paul, I have on hand the copies of your reports on the rescue of the men on the disabled STS-52. It is fortunate that the lunar radar stations could compute their orbit. The detailed official report will follow, but briefly this is what happened. The life ship landed, or rather crashed, several miles west of Cheyenne, as you know. But it was impossible to find the man who was piloting it until yesterday because of the weather. He has been identified as Ronald Watkins Clayton, exiled to Mars 15 years ago. Evidently, he didn't realise that 15 years of Martian gravity had so weakened his muscles that he could hardly walk under the pull of a full Earth G. As it was, he could only crawl about 100 yards from the wrecked life ship before he collapsed. Well, I hope this clears up everything. I hope you're not getting the snowstorms up there like we've been getting them. John B. Remley, Captain, CBI. The end of the man who hated Mars. Recorded by David Castle.